So, wow, there's like so much to talk about, so many new developments. So first of all, there's apparently this Esper a group called Eleven, which is pretty fascinating. And it goes to make you think like, this story isn't as linear as we thought. One could just randomly throw out these crazy things out of nowhere and supplement the story and send it into a completely different direction. So the last time we heard about an Esper group in this world was like, in the flashback um, towards the Fubuki and uh, Psycho stuff when they were in high school and they talked about the invisible hand. I actually made a video about this because it was something that the community didn't really talk about, maybe because it was just, you know, thrown out in that, you know, flashback and they never really went into it anymore. It's possible that Otento, uh, the leader of the Eleven, maybe he had something to do with the invisible hand. Maybe he was like one of the remnants of it or something because she says, um, it makes me nostalgically sick hearing his name. So, you know, that means that it's from her past possibly. So maybe he has something to do with that. But regardless, Tatsumaki says it's gonna be, uh, become quite a chore to go after them. So maybe they're powerful. I mean, obviously they kind of have to be if they're coming after Tatsumaki. But then again, we have seen a lot of uh, people that underestimate the S-Class heroes in this series. So. I'm not sure where this is headed, but it's pretty interesting that Tatsumaki is going to have to do something about them, and, uh, you know, maybe they will be powerful, and maybe they'll actually, I don't know, pose a threat to Tatsumaki, because we know that espers can be stopped, even Tatsumaki, like Psychos, despite being way weaker uh, than Tatsumaki, was able to counter her, you know, catching her on the, uh, the offense and defense um, aspect of her abilities. Like she can't attack and defend at the same time. So that's how she was able to get her and have the Cadres capitalize on her before. So then Flashy Flash is going after the abandoned masses. Uh, there's like a quick translation update to that. So it could either mean like masses of crowd of people from a fallen world or a desolated world or something like that. Uh, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Abandoned masses is whatever, but maybe in the future translations, they'll decide to name them something else. But we all know who they're talking about at this point. So apparently they're like the second, or I don't know, maybe they're tied for first strongest ninja organization. I don't know. It, apparently they were rivals to the uh, Ninja Village or something. And now that they're gone, they've come to the surface and uh, they're trying to take over the underworld, as Flashy Flash says, and their whole goal is to cull the masses, which I, I don't know, they just wanna kill everyone until they just have enough people um, for some reason. Maybe we'll get to the explanation why that is. Maybe they're tied to God. Maybe Eleven is tied to God too because of all of that Esper stuff, but that's speculation for another video. Uh, another thing about this ninja group is that they said that they'll be, uh, they await at the remains of the village. So maybe now we're gonna come back to the ninja leader dude. Cause remember the last time we saw him, he was off panel by Saitama and we didn't really know if he was killed or not. Uh, and that also goes into Hellfire and Gale. We don't know if they were entirely dead because they're also at the ninja village too. So once Flashy Flash meets up with these guys, maybe we'll find out what happened with the ninja leader and Hellfire and Gale, or maybe the ninja leader will actually get to see him fight and maybe he'll job to the abandoned masses leader possibly to establish how powerful they are i mean he says it will be no easy task so maybe they're powerful too and another interesting thing about it's specifically tatsumaki and flashy flash that are kind of going on their own little side quests here that means that they're not obviously going to be around for like the city stuff you know like the neo heroes and the hero association so if there is going to be a civil war or a conflict between them that means that Tatsumaki and Flashy Flash aren't gonna be involved in that battle, and maybe that's why one is doing it on purpose, so that it's somewhat even, because you know, if Tatsumaki and Flashy Flash was there, they would dominate, you know, the well, more or less. At this at this point in time, it seems like they would dominate. We don't know the full power of the Neo Heroes yet, but you know what I'm trying to say. So then we're seeing what the other S-Class heroes are up to, and like it goes to Metal Knight, who we haven't seen in a while, and they're still kind of putting it out there that maybe Metal Knight has serious beef with the Hero Association. Maybe they're gonna bar him from the Hero Association. Maybe he's gonna try to take them over. And I like this because it also shows Drive Knight in this chapter. Remember, I've been talking about this. We need to see Drive Knight because we haven't seen him in a very long time. We only have like four, maybe five panels of Drive Knight in the entire webcomic. And this is the first time we've seen him in a very, very, very long time. And he is gonna be integral to this overall story considering you know the organization with the new heroes and everything. But I like how they're setting up this contrast here. It's like, oh, Drive Knight is dependable, Metal Knight isn't. It wants you to pick sides in both stories. And you know, as I say, I'm on Team Metal Knight. 
Drive Knight's definitely the traitor and a part of the organization, in my opinion. Uh, but I like how they're trying to, like, you know, play with your mind here. It's like, oh, you know, trust Drive Knight. Middle Knight is your enemy. So then we also see Atomic Samurai and the Disciples. They're apparently going on a, a training thing. So they're going to be gone for a little bit. It says um, for several weeks, actually. So... Are they gonna get a uh, power up or something? I mean, I assume so. I mean, somewhat. And maybe the disciples will become that much more powerful as to where they are able to join the S class and then they take over those rankings that were left by, like, you know, uh, Super Ally Darkshine, Metal Bat, and Ch uh, Child Emperor. Maybe they take those spots now. That would be something interesting that I didn't really even take into consideration before. And then we see Watchdog Man as, as well. You know, he's. No, no real d developments on him. He's still sticking to Q-City, but another character uh, that we barely ever see in the webcomic. Like, I think we've even seen less of Watchdog Man than we've seen of Drive Knight in the webcomic. But then coming back to uh, Zombie Man and Dr. Genus, we're finally getting to see where that storyline is headed, because the last time they talked to each other, I think it was like chapter 106 or 107, um, he, he, they were talking about the limiter and all that stuff, and Zombie was like, hey, remove my limiter, and Dr. Genius was like, no. But there's something in my basement I would like to show you. So they are doing some kind of training here. So Dr. Genius said that he's not going to remove Zombie Man's limiter, so I suppose maybe he's trying to give him the Zenkai, maybe, or just get him through those walls that uh, Psycho's was talking about in Chapter 92 of the manga, you know, how she got Orochi is as powerful as he is. Maybe that's what they're trying to do here, but it's going to be more difficult considering Zombie Man's abilities. How, like, you know, a normal person can come close to death in a very different way than Zombie Man would. So, whatever Dr. Genus is doing, I suppose this is going to benefit Zombie Man to some degree. I just would like to see exactly what's going on here, because, like, you know, how is he doing this to Zombie Man? Does he have, like, a new monster or something? So then we're coming to Child Emperor going over that eel monster that Blue defeated, and he's pulling this microchip out of his head, and this just goes into what I've been speculating this whole time, and it's that the organization is definitely in control of these dragons. Uh, the five dragons that showed up a couple chapters back. It wasn't a coincidence that they all came out at the same time, uh, and I was like, yeah, the organization is definitely in control of these dragons, and I think this is further proving that they put these chips into their head to monitor them or maybe control them to some degree, and I'm sure that will eventually come to the surface. Uh, but and then we see Webby Gaza coming behind Child Emperor, so they're gonna have some kind of conflict uh, We'll talk about that in the next review that's gonna come out later and then capping off the chapter we see in Felsenave and Zadit They are back. We thought that they were dead because you know in the first live combat that the uh, The Neo heroes had they got completely destroyed But now they're back to normal and they have like suits on similar to how uh, Erwin and Redestro have and we see that A says that the surgery was successful. So I think these guys are have just been um, augmented by the organization as well. Airman and Redestro, they took them and then cyborged them up. And then, I don't know, just made them more pawns for them to control. I mean, obviously they need them for their financial backing and for um, Infelsonave's cult following and everything. And then we see Metal Bat coming up to them and like, hey, can I talk to you for a second? Because remember a couple chapters back, Metal Bat was the one that spotted Eremin and Destro taking Infelsenave and Zadit's bodies, you know, back into that alley, suspiciously. So now he's going to question them about that, like, hey, what was going on with that? Uh, so we'll see what happens in the next chapter with that. Let me know what you thought about this chapter in the comments, guys. If you liked the review, please give it a like. Also have a Patreon, and I have a Twitch. We react to the live chapters on there every time they get released. Uh, and then also just have a great day. I'll see you in the next one. All right, so bear with me because I'm going to be talking about a lot of stuff in this review that hasn't necessarily been confirmed yet. And that's basically Eremin and Destro, the two security guards, being a part of the organization. And therefore, the organization is secretly pulling the strings of the Neo heroes. So all of this exposition that we're getting in the beginning of this chapter is... I, I suppose us, for the first time, getting some major insight into how the organization works, which we didn't really know before. We know that they were producing those AI robots like, you know, G4, G5, and Machine God uh, Mirror, which is probably going to be G6 once he makes it to the manga. But now we're seeing the cyborg side of things. So they're pretty much explaining that, like, they can take a person, regardless of if they were, like, fatally injured or whatever, as long as their brain is intact, 
they can make them anew into a cyborg and then they're essentially functioning again, but functioning to their own discretion. It doesn't seem like they might have their own free will anymore. I mean, we'll get into what's going on with Webby Gaza, but it's, you know, said by Metal Bat that like, you know, they've lost the, the ambition or whatever in their eyes, talking about Zaditz and Infelsinave, which we saw in the previous chapter. And like I speculated in the previous review, they're pretty much just the tools of the organization now. Now the brain, that's pretty interesting that they say that specifically as long as the brain is intact, because we know that one of the mascots of the organization is what the fandom has uh, deemed the brain robot. And that's because we see his brain very clearly. And I've also speculated that the brain robot is one of these people, probably the shorter one, probably um, Araman, the, you know, the, the hair, That's that might be the brain robot, you know, with like a skin suit on and the gray fox robot that was with the brain robot might be uh destro We're seeing that metal bat is suspicious of them rightfully so like we talked about in the previous chapter he saw them taking in felsenave and uh zaditz their bodies and walking away with them in a very weird manner so i like i just like metal bat because he's just so he's just a pure good guy i mean yeah he's unruly at times and maybe almost seems heelish in a way but he's not he that's just the way that he is he's like a brash bancho you know archetype but he is like one of the purest S class heroes i would say he does have the best intentions in mind so now we're coming back to webby gaza encountering child emperor and she's definitely suspicious, and we're actually getting her full backstory here, or at least most of it. And it's that she didn't really have any talent, and she says that she trained and whatnot, but didn't get to the chance, or didn't get to the point of taking the hero exam, which is kind of odd because, like, pretty much anyone can take the hero exam, uh, because we see, like, see the C-class heroes, you know, they're. I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe she was like one of those dudes that we saw like when Saitama was taking the exam. Like she wasn't even good enough to, I guess, pass it or whatever. But then we saw that her agency uh, let her know about the uh, augmentation services uh, supplied by the Neo Heroes, which is definitely the organization. So now this is di directly tying Webby Gaza to the organization. Like we saw that she was a 70% or 71%, I don't remember the exact number, uh, cyborg, which is pretty impressive, strong enough to be a Neo leader evidently. But they've also like nerfed her in a way to where she's relying on them and that she has to keep going back to them for maintenance. And she doesn't regret it because, you know, this is what she ultimately wants. So you kind of feel bad for Webby Gaza in a way. So. While she is probably a bad guy, uh, because like it goes back to them uh, tr transforming people into cyborgs and whatnot, we saw how Infelsinave and Zaditz essentially lost their own wills. Maybe Webigaza has a similar thing going on here where she can act as if she has her own free will, but it's very possible that she's just, you know, going along with what they want. Because I don't think it's a coincidence that she's stumbling upon Child Emperor uh, at the exact moment that he's discovered what's going on with the eels, which is also directly tied to the organization controlling these dragon monsters. But us feeling bad for her and seeing her like somewhat of a tragic backstory makes me think that she might be set up for a redemption later on once everything is all said and done. And maybe the things that require her to go back for maintenance, might that might be fixed. Maybe by uh, Dr. Kuseno, if he turns out to not be a bad guy, which, you know, I'm kind of sus on him. Maybe somebody from the Hero Association, maybe Metal Knight, but just let's put a pin on that storyline for now. So then we're coming to Darkshine. We're actually seeing him training the Neo Hero students or whatever they're called, because we knew that this was going to be Darkshine's role coming into the Neo Heroes. He was never going to be like a Neo leader or have any active duty or whatever. He's still traumatized uh, by the whole Wake and Garo thing and everything, and that's you know, touched on because, you know, uh, Purry Purry Prisoner calls him and I like the little comical panel where he's like, Purry Purry Prisoner, how'd you get my number? <laughs> but he's like asking him like, you know, how can I, how can I help my um, prisoner guys? I'm trying to train them as we saw in the previous chapter. Uh, you know, how can I get them into the mindset of being a warrior and whatnot? And he's like, look, I, I can, you know, teach you how to eat. I can teach you how to train, but I can't teach you how to be a warrior or have that type of mentality. I'm broken. 
So I think this is just further illustrating that he hasn't had any development in that area yet. Like Darkshine is still very damaged and we're not going to see him get into any active combat for a while. Do I think he eventually will? Yeah, it'll probably eventually get to the point where he's going to fight Raiden, I assume. And then uh, maybe that will be his big overcoming moment uh, or his big character arc where he realizes that I am a hero and that I don't have to, you know, give in to my insecurities or whatever else is going on with me. But then we're coming to the end of the chapter with uh, Aramin and Destro showing Metal Bat the recovery room, the place where they make the cyborgs and stuff like that. And they're like, go ahead and check it out. And I like how Metal Bat's like really honest. He's like, well, you know, I don't even know what's going on with this stuff. So I wouldn't even be able to tell you if you are being sus or not so i'll just give you the benefit of the doubt but then uh mars leo and solitude or coco whatever his name is they come out of nowhere and they blindside metal bat and we definitely see that they've been modified or at least mars leo has so i suppose they've both undergone more cyber cyborgification i mean Dev solitude was already in that process because uh, he came from like that fighting league but i suppose they've been amplified with power and then they have the suits on as well so they're able to actually you know, blindside metal bat and do some damage to him and i like how metal bat isn't like fighting back immediately he's like hey they attacked me you know do something about it like metal bat's actually trying to play by the rules here but they're like you know you'll make a fine specimen metal bat uh, because they're basically saying that like we want to use you we want to take your body and make you into one of our cyborgs or you, you know you're compliant with us and they're like kill him this is moving way faster than i thought it was going to be like they're straight up exposing themselves to metal bat right now and it's getting to the point of where he has to defend himself so i think we're seeing his fighting spirit kick in in this last panel here where he just zooms up immediately super fast this is i think metal bat's best speed feat so far at least in the webcomic because he hardly has any feats in it anyway but now he's getting to where he's like i'm not good at the complicated stuff so i'll just have to decide which one of you i'm gonna beat first so he's definitely gonna fight back and i assume that metal bat is gonna make short work of these guys i mean maybe they're somewhat s-class level right now with the suits on and the cyborg improvements and stuff like that because before they were neo leader candidates which was probably like a class level or something like that but i assume he's going to take these guys out and then we might see metal bat fight aramin and destro and that's going to be a different story because they're implied to be ultra powerful like 94 and 95 percent was enough to make Solitude like crap his pants. So I, I don't know exactly how powerful that is because we're gonna have to see how strong Genos is on the cyborg scale. Like we still don't have a percentage on him. So if we know what Genos' percentage is, then we'll know for sure how powerful Aramin and Destro is because we also don't even really know how powerful Webby Gaza is. And she's at 70%, which is strong enough to be a Neo leader. So these guys have to be dragon level somewhat, I suppose. So, and even if they do, fight metal bat like what's gonna happen I mean, metal bat's obviously not gonna die here I, I don't i don't expect him to die or even become a cyborg at this point so either he's gonna fight them and lose or somebody's gonna intervene or something i, I i'm just I, i'm really looking forward to seeing what's gonna happen with this storyline because it's it's at a critical point right now and, and like major things are gonna happen but that's pretty much it for the review today, guys. Let me know what you thought about this chapter in the comments. What do you think is going to happen? Uh, and if you liked it, please give it a like. Please subscribe as well. Trying to reach that subscriber milestone before the end of the year. Also have a Patreon and a Discord. And have a great day. I'll see you in the next one. All right, so this was probably the most hyped chapter so far, you know, in the string of three chapters that we've gotten in three days, which is awesome. Thank you, one. So it starts off with, you know, Webby Gaza and Child Emperor continuing their little talk that they had. And it's revealed that the Neo heroes have like a satellite similar to what we see Child Emperor has in the manga that can track people. So it makes sense for why things are playing out the way that they are, especially at the end of the chapter, which we'll get into. 
but also they're tracking a my mask, which we know they probably had incentive for doing that initially, and we know Blue especially wants it, but it's just in the best favor of the Neo Heroes to do that to win, you know, more of the public appeal over and everything. So that's an important part that we have to remember. They're putting it out there for a reason. But then we're coming to one of the big surprises of this chapter and Sonic uh, going against A. And I like that Sonic knows about A and he like doesn't respect him at all. This is also building up Sonic more as like an anti-hero. Here we're seeing that the Neo heroes or more so the organization wants Sonic because he'll make a great cyborg, which is obviously true. And I suppose they were able to find him through the satellite, which is gonna answer a lot of questions. But A, interestingly enough, seems to know more about what's going on with the cyborgification stuff than the other Neo heroes or the other Neo leaders. Cause he knows pretty much that you're gonna become a puppet for them if you do go under, uh, undergo the cyborg stuff. So that's an interesting thing. I don't know, maybe he's more affiliated with the Neo heroes or maybe he himself has undergone the cyborgification too. And that remains to be seen possibly. But we're seeing Sonic back in action. You know, we haven't seen him since the whole Heavenly Ninja Party stuff, but this is also confirming you know, one of our suspicions is that he did in fact get one of those scrolls from the ninja leader guy, uh, him, he who should not be named. Uh, and he received like the electric discharge fist, uh, which is awesome, you know, power up for Sonic. Cause we saw that Flashy Flash also got uh, power up a couple chapters back. He had that wind thing that he did against the, uh, the heavy smoker monster. And he also says that, you know, maybe the scroll that I got was better than the one that Flashy Flash got, but that just confirms that. And also Sonic's still powerful as ever uh, because A can't really do anything to him, at least in the speed department. And he makes quick work of the Neo uh, hero dudes that have the suits on as expected. But we don't really know how A, how strong A is in comparison to the other Neo leaders. I mean, if he's a Neo leader, then I guess he's S-class level, take that for what you will. But I never really got the the kind of feeling that A was like one of the stronger ones, you know, the way that like rated is implied to be. So I, I just think this is a solid performance for Sonic more than anything. So then we're coming back to Purry with the prisoners or as he calls the Purry Purry prison partners. And a big surprise to me, Hammerhead is a part of this group, which is cool because, you know, we all know Hammerhead. He's, uh, you know, in season one, so he's one of the more well-known characters, but we haven't seen him since that sequence, at least in the web comic. In the anime, it made it seem like he was on the straight and narrow and he was going on like job interviews, but I guess in the web comic, he just straight up went, went to Smelly Lit Prison and now he's with Purry and he's getting somewhat of a redemption, I guess. Hey, me in the future. I also wanted to point out that Hammerhead has history with the organization. He's actually in that sequence where the organization is first revealed in the series. So I'm sure that's gonna come back into play too. Maybe he knows some stuff that will help the Hero Association or the Heroes or something like that. But then we're coming to Raiden showing up demanding that, you know, the prisoners come with him, they become cyborgs. And then he's even like, hey, Purry, you deserve to be in jail as well, like permanently. And he's like, look, I'm gonna take them by force if you don't straight up give them over. So I think this is an important sequence here because, you know, I've always been speculating that there's probably gonna be a civil war between the Neo Heroes and the Hero Association. This might be the catalyst for it because this is like the first time where we're actually probably gonna see Hero Association versus Neo Heroes, because Raiden, I assume that he's gonna destroy Purry. <laughs> now, I don't know how strong Purry is in the webcomic currently. Maybe he's had some off-panel training or whatever. His power level is ambiguous at this point because we haven't seen him in a very long time. But Raiden pretty much showed that he's more or less on the level of Darkshine, if not even stronger than Darkshine. It remains to be seen, but I would say he's implied to be way stronger than Purry at this point. So expect Purry to get dominated. And then the Hero Association obviously isn't gonna take that lightly. They're gonna be like, whoa, that's a direct, you know, act of aggression against us. We need to retaliate. Or maybe the other heroes are like, hey, we need to retaliate. We can't just let these Neo heroes walk all over us. And this is probably gonna start that civil conflict possibly. But then we're coming to the incredible end of this chapter where we see Sui Ryu with his gang of Neo heroes. And they say that they have tracked down the hero hunter 
which we know is of course Garo. So yeah, so many questions here. Why is Garo working with the Beaver Movers? The last time we saw Garo was I think chapter 111 or something where King stumbles upon him under that waterfall. And we knew that Garo was pretty much going on like a vision quest, trying to figure things out for himself, similar to how King was in that chapter. That's why he was meditating under that waterfall across from where that secret mummified monk master was. So I guess Garo maybe came to the conclusion that, you know what? I'm just gonna live a normal life. Uh, I'm gonna stop chasing power, stop chasing heroes, stop chasing monsters, and I'm just gonna, you know, be a blue collar worker, I guess, <laughs> because clearly he's just doing a regular job here. And if Garo really needed money, I don't think he would have to do this job. He could probably just be a fighter or something like that, right? Like a prize fighter or something. So either Garo has like come to like a complete 180 in his ideology, or maybe he's having similar conflicts to Darkshine, maybe, but also like, Suiryu is here. This is setting up Suiryu versus Garo potentially. Now, I don't want to get everyone's hopes up because obviously we saw this happen in OVA 4 of season 2. It was awesome. Although they didn't like literally fight, it was like in the video game. But this either is going to be straight up Suiryu taking on Garo in a canon like environment because this will eventually happen in the manga as well or Suiryu is going to encounter Garo and Garo's going to be like I give up fighting I'm not a fighter anymore and then I don't know he goes peacefully or he just doesn't fight back and then just takes a beating from Suiryu I certainly hope that they fight each other I mean that would be amazing and it also goes into how strong is Garo right now I have no idea I doubt he's as strong as Awakened Garo, considering, you know, after the face busted open and the smoke came out, he was like, the God Slayer Fizz is leaving me, no, so I doubt he has that strength, but I don't know if he's retained some of the gains <laughs> that he made through his monsterfication and his, you know, his uh, journey to power that he had, because we can assume that he's a full-blown human right now. Uh, I don't know, there's so many question marks with Garo and his power and just everything about him at this point, but hopefully we go into that into the next chapter uh, and they don't stray away from this and go back to Metal Bat. I just want to see this because, you know, Garo's awesome, but let me know what you think about this in the comments. What do you think is going to happen with Garo? How strong do you think he is? If you like the review, guys, please give it a like and please subscribe. I'm trying to get to that milestone by the end of the year. Uh, and also I have a Patreon, a Twitch, and uh, have a great day. I'll see you in the next one. So it was kind of set up in the previous chapter that this would happen, but not only did it, but it also delivered. This is like one of the best webcomic chapters there is. And I'm just so satisfied with this, so good. Uh, and it makes you think like, man, what's this gonna look like in the manga? Because now we're actually going to have, well, we do have, canonical Garo versus Suiryu twice in one year because earlier this year we got the OVA 4 from season 2 and that featured Garo versus Suiryu but you know in the VR but still we got to see it but now this is like it's literally happening and like I said it makes you think like what's this gonna be like in the manga it's gonna be incredible but you know don't hold your breath and when I say like maybe five to seven years from now I mean it's like literally might be five to seven years before we see this fight in the manga but still we're gonna see it eventually but anyway so we see the neo heroes going after garo and we see that they're like shooting him with those tranquilizer dart the reason for this or at least in my opinion is because they're trying to bring him in alive because they want to make a cyborg out of him that's like their whole thing but this is also finally answering the question that we had about garo for a while now and it's like how strong is he post awakenedness? Now, let me also put it out there that I'm pretty sure he's no longer a monster or has trace amounts of monster in him or anything that has to go into that, the pseudo monster stuff. Any kind of supernatural abilities outside of just his inherent superhumanness, I think is gone from him. At least we haven't seen anything like that. It still could be the case. Maybe he can like become monstery again. Maybe he can go red at least red eyes. I mean, if he wants to dye his hair again with blood, he, that's optional. But we saw that like at the end of his fight with Saitama, his mask cracked or, you know, his mask and the smoke, the monsterfication, the supernaturalness ability came out of him. And he was like, oh no, the God Slayer fist has left me. So I think that was showing us that like anything that was making him that powerful to be Awakened Garo is no longer there. So 
does that mean that he still has the power up from the Zenkai that he received, you know, against Royal Ripper and Bug God? Does it mean that he still has that growth that he attained from like fighting Darkshine and Golden S and all those? Is all of that stuff mutually exclusive to monsterfication and what Garo was going through? Because obviously that all led to him becoming Awakened Garo. Now that he is no longer Awakened Garo, does he still have that power? I mean, obviously he still has the experience and the knowledge, but does he have the, I'll say, hypertrophy <laughs> acquired from those previous battles? I mean, maybe, maybe not. It's still even debatable if we have seen his full potential in this fight. Because even Suiryu says, it's like, unbelievable, you don't seem to even have used even half of your full strength yet. So it's like, maybe he did, maybe he did it. I'm going to assume that he did it. And Garo is probably stronger than what he's letting on to be here. But speaking of strength, we're seeing Suiryu's incredible strength here, and he's just as physically strong in the webcomic as he was in the manga. Because we saw that he cracked the stage against Saitama, great feat of power, and he's like throwing the delivery truck at uh, Garo here, even before he activates his suit. So yeah, Suiryu is just still a powerhouse. And another great feat of static strength from Garo, we'll say, uh, him grabbing the truck, which is pretty awesome. We don't typically see like, you know, like I said, static feats of strength from Garo. It's usually like we see him going against other like super powerful individuals in like uh, combat stuff like that. But going back to Shuiryu activating his suit, he reveals that all of the Neo leaders have the limiter release ability. And we saw that with Blue. We thought, you know, maybe that was exclusive to Blue because it goes into his power set which is still not completely explained at this point, but Suiryu has it and it makes him crazy powerful. I mean, he definitely goes to the next level because he starts to overwhelm Garo and in exchange of blows here, this reminds me of like when Garo was going against Darkshine with the Crossfang Dragon Slayer fish. It's a very similar sequence here and I'm pretty sure maybe that's what one is trying to draw parallels here because he was overwhelming Darkshine, except in this instance, Garo is the one being overwhelmed. And that also brings me back to the question of like, so is Garo like using his full strength here to combat against the released limiter aspect of the Neo Hero power suit? Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe not, probably not. Uh, even though he does get knocked down and put into that crater, he still gets back up and he's going after Suiryu. So that could be Garo's inherent uh, you know, growth ability, you know, like what we saw against Darkshine, what we saw against Tank Top Master, like I'm pretty sure Garo hasn't lost that. I also like how Suiryu like loses control and the suit kind of takes him over. I think that's going to come back into play later on because I'm pretty sure that the organization is going to eventually try to forcibly take over uh, control of everybody who's wearing the suits at some point. I mean, obviously this is like a minor malfunction, I suppose, but I think that's gonna play into that larger narrative later on. So then we come to the end of the fight where the guy that Garo was working with like starts freaking out and he's like, yeah, you ruined everything, my livelihood. And so it's interesting how Garo reacts to this. It seems like he has had some character development because obviously Hero Hunter Garo wouldn't have reacted like this. He wouldn't have cared. But this Garo, which I guess is Job Hunter Garo now, he seems to actually care somewhat and he stops fighting and he walks away. I mean, Hero Hunter Garo would have kept fighting Suiryu until he was unconscious, but this Garo seems to be reserved somewhat. So whatever kind of training or vision quest he underwent, like we saw when he was under the waterfall, it seems to have progressed Garo in some way, whether it's for the better or the worse. But what's the future for Garo after this? unsure i didn't expect him to come back into the story this soon i for sure thought he was going to come back after this arc was over so either this was like a little taste uh, of garo to show us like what's going on with him or he's going to come back later on in this arc and help everybody out in the civil war maybe i mean it's possible but man it, there's just so many unknowns with him at this moment i would love it if he comes back more garo the better but i'm also cool with him staying on the side until later on in the series. But then as for the end of this chapter where Sui Ryu is saying that like, oh, I'm surprised to read that name in the hero registry. I suppose I'll go check on him tomorrow. I assume he's talking about Suiko because she just became one of the heroes in the Hero Association and we haven't really seen them meet or link up or anything and talk or anything like that. So I assume it's her unless it's like Saitama and that's retconned into the webcomic because we also have to remember that 
Sui Ryu in the webcomic, obviously very different from the manga Sui Ryu. He hasn't had that development. He hasn't had those uh, interactions with characters such as Saitama in this martial arts tournament. So if this Sui Ryu does know Saitama, it would have to be like thrown in there in like a flashback or something that happened off panel or something, or like I said, a retcon or something. I don't think it's that, although it could be pretty short just Suiko here, but let me know what you think about this chapter in the comments. If you like the review, guys, please give it a like. Please subscribe, trying to reach 100K by the end of the year. Also have Patreon, Twitch, uh, other stuff. Have a great day. So this chapter opens up with the Fubuki group, I guess, watching the news. And they're seeing like reports of the success of the Neo heroes. We're seeing that Ryuman and Excel have been having success. And that the Hero Association and the heroes within it, including the Fubuki group itself, are getting kind of overshadowed by the accomplishments of the Neo heroes, at least in the media's eyes. But it's also confirmed in this sequence that Fubuki is confirmed to have been promoted to A class. A couple chapters back, Fubuki said that she was going to leave B class and go up to A class. So now we're like officially getting confirmation that she is in fact in the A class. We don't know what her exact ranking is, but I wouldn't be surprised if she's towards like the bottom of it, maybe a little higher than that possibly. But the other Fubuki storyline that's finally getting picked up here is what is going on with her and Psychos? Because it's been, <laughs> I think a few years since we've got an update on this stuff. So back in the Psychic Sisters arc, Fubuki winds up taking Psychos from like the Heroes Association jail and like flies off with her somewhere. So it turns out that she does in fact have psychos at like I guess their base, their clubhouse, wherever they are right now. And Fubuki is like psychically linking with psychos here by touching her head. This also might give more credence to the whole thing about Blast being some sort of esper because there's the theory that you know recently in the manga he's touching Tatsumaki's head when she's a kid and it appears that he could be reading her mind when he like figures out who Fubuki is. Again, just, you know, still a theory at this point, but it seems like it might be more likely considering that she's touching Psychos' head and I don't going into her mind, but also this place that they're going to, this psychic uh, spiritual world is pretty much the same place that we saw Phoenix Man take Child Emperor in the recent revisions of chapter 99 and 100. I pointed out in my reviews for those chapters that this is like something that Esper seemingly are able to do. Like, it's not just an ability unique to Phoenix Man. Uh, this just seems like some place that exists that like if you're strong enough or if you can tap into a certain wavelength or some kind of ability, you can visit this place. And we're seeing Fubuki continuing to question Psychos here because originally when she visited her in the Hero Association jail, she asked her what she saw in her vision. The vision that was revealed in Psychos and Fubuki's flashback to when they were in high school. We saw that Psychos was able to use the third eye Esper ability, pretty much the same thing that Shibaba was using to be able to predict the future. And when Psychos tapped into this ability, she saw something that like made her go insane pretty much. It's implied that she was kind of seeing like the apocalypse or what the apocalypse could be. And it's very likely that that is tied to whatever is going to happen with God. So following up on that, we're seeing Psycho saying, I failed, there is no forgiveness. And then Fubuki's like, for what, by whom? And then Psycho says, I don't know, I don't know. And then this just further frustrates Fubuki. I'm assuming that Psychos is talking about being somewhat of a messenger for a God that she's not even completely aware of. This is also touched on a couple chapters back in the manga's continuity. When we see Psychos have this vision of uh, what appears to be the being God, and she says that she was chosen by him. So I'm assuming that this is, you know, pretty much going along the same storyline. So then it cuts to Sui Ryu on a motorcycle driving to the Hero Association because at the end of the previous chapter, Sui Ryu finds out that Suiko is a part of the Hero Association, uh, his sister, and he says that he's gonna go check on her. While he's driving there, I guess he's hearing like the news in his earpiece or something. And the report saying the former sumo living legend Raiden just shook the entire world after having a clash on the streets with Puri Puri Prisoner. Whereas public opinion leads towards Raiden, both factions still haven't commented on the matter as of today. So yeah, this is a small, somewhat ambiguous update on what's going on between Burry Burry Prisoner and Raiden. We saw that they were having an altercation because Raiden was like, you know, hey, Purry, you should be in jail. I, I don't think it's cool that like the Hero Association is allowing you to do whatever you want out here. And Raiden was gonna, I don't know, kind of apprehend Purry, but then that sequence ended and we don't know what happened. So now it turns out apparently something did happen, but we just don't know. 
Uh, in my opinion, I think Raiden probably stomped Puri. <laughs> Um, he seems to be more powerful than him, like a lot more powerful than him, at least in my opinion. I mean, maybe I could be wrong. Maybe Puri beat him. That would be uh, quite the twist. But I think it's possible that Raiden might have beat him and then, I don't know, put him into custody or something like that. So then we see Blue with some kind of like jetpack on flying overhead of Suiryu and he's on his way to the Hero Association as well. But another thing I want to point out is that in this sequence, uh, the thing that Suiryu is listening to says, and then there's the top ranked one. He said, to be the son of Blast. So whenever Blue being brought up as the son of Blast is always kind of phrased in that similar light. Almost as if it's not like 100% confirmed that he is actually the son of Blast. Because I, I guess it's not, right? We're only really going off of word of mouth at this point. So it's possible that Blue might not actually literally be the son of Blast, you know? I'm not saying that he's not, but I'm just putting it out there that this might not be completely the truth. I mean, it's possible that he might be like the son of him, but not like the biological son, possibly. I think there's more to Blue than what we actually see on the surface here. You know, maybe, maybe not, but you know, there's definitely gonna be some developments here with that stuff. So Blue rolls up on the Hero Association. He starts yelling at it. He's like, I'm the top ranked of the Neo Hero Nobody was answering my call, so I came in person. He's also like, I have a personal suggestion for the future of the hero industry. There is also something I want to ask about my father, Blast. So that's also pretty interesting, him asking about Blast, something that he doesn't know. But also at the same time, <laughs> we see the heroes named Victim Association uh, also protesting. So they're like shouting over him and it's all getting like mixed together. This is a hilarious sequence. This just further shows that one is like, one of the best comedic writers in the manga game. We're coming to something that I've been looking forward to for so long, and that's Blue encountering Saitama, like face to face pretty much. And Blue's like, I don't know who you are, but I saw you. You must be some kind of secret weapon that isn't registered in the hero list. I already know you're no ordinary person. Is your intention to stay hidden and only leave behind results, building up some kind of mythos? The method of operation. You're not trying to become the next Blast, are you? That's also pretty funny because that is Blast in a nutshell, right? And then he also says, trying to drag down Blast and take his number one spot, huh? Well, tough luck, only I can do that. So that's also giving us more insight into the true goals and motives uh, of Blue, which were kind of alluded to up until this point, but now he's just putting his cards on the table. So then he finds out Saitama's name and he says, ah, well, I'm sure we'll be meeting again on the battlefield. I'll show you out there that my strength of resolve is way out of your league. So yeah, Blue is uh, naive like many other characters in this series in relation to gauging one's power, especially Saitama's. So does this mean that Blue is going to challenge Saitama to a fight or something like that in the future? It's very possible. At the minimum, I think he might try to, uh, I don't know, steal Saitama's thunder against a monster or something like this, but this is for sure setting up a future encounter between these two. And as I've speculated before, like if this does happen and Blue tries to test himself against Saitama and Saitama like smacks Blue or something, that might catch the attention of Blast. And that's how we get his introduction uh, real time into the story maybe. But after this, we're getting the meeting between Suiko and Saitama. So Suiko is excited to meet Saitama because a couple chapters back, Saitama saved her from G6 or the machine god mirror. Like it was about to take her out pretty much and he, you know, one punched it. So that has her super interested in him. So she's like, how did you get so powerful? I was also trained in martial arts, you see. So if you're interested, we can exchange techniques and stuff. And yeah, of course, Saitama isn't interested in this. And then he gives his literal explanation of his power. He's like, well, I, you know, I did push ups and sit ups. So now we're also getting the first on panel meeting between Suiryu and Suiko. Suiko is proud of Suiryu for having a proper job. And Suiryu is proud of her for becoming an A-class hero. But then we get this confusion between them because like Suiryu thinks that that Suiko is like interested in Saitama and that they're gonna date or something. And you know, she also says he's stronger than you. So he kind of tests Saitama by throwing a kick to his face, you know, similar to, you know, their initial meeting in the manga as well. But then he like offers both of them to join the Neo heroes and basically they both decline. So that's not gonna happen. But then it cuts to Genos encountering Blue again. These two had met 
uh, previously when we saw you know Blue tracking Saitama when he still had a My Mask with him. And this is also the first time we're seeing Genos in his uh, newest upgrade form because when he was going against the Family of Darkness, the first dragon that he officially soloed, at least in the webcomic, uh, he was completely destroyed by that. So now he has a new upgrade and he kind of looks similar to his Daedric manga form, but I guess this is like maybe the webcomic iteration of that. But Blue reveals to Genos that apparently Metal Knight has been secretly conducting experiments using monsters. There was also a theory that the insane strength of the monsters as of late is due to them being enhanced by someone. And this was revealed to him by a hero association, an executive who defected to the Neo hero. So pretty sure Blue is referring to the big five dragon, you know, outbreak thing that happened a couple chapters back. It makes sense that they would think that Metal Knight is the culprit of this because he was, I don't know if he was experimenting on the monsters, but he definitely did have some monsters captive in the Hero Association. And it was mainly just to reinforce his own defense robots and make them stronger and whatnot. But the true culprits behind all of this, you know, monster outbreak and experimenting and stuff like that is the organization. And that's because we know that that's their ultimate goal, collecting data, getting stronger and whatnot. And also G6 or the Machine God Mirror showed up, you know, coincidentally at the same time that the other dragons did. So this is just further continuing this off some storyline of like who's the traitor is it metal knight is it drive knight and yes in the webcomic continuity it's still drive knight for sure that is the traitor and a part of the organization but this is like one's red herring to make you think that maybe it could be metal knight instead but then the chapter ends with genos telling everything that he learned from blue to saitama and what i'm getting from this is that genos is going to maybe try to investigate this and i assume this will you know take him down the rabbit hole further of figuring out like who is you know, truly behind this, either Metal Knight or Drive Knight, and this might lead to, I don't know, Genos inadvertently teaming up with Drive Knight and the organization, but just you know, being gaslighted by them and eventually being portrayed, and then you eventually find out that Metal Knight is the good guy the whole time. I don't know, but that's pretty much it for the chapter today, guys. Let me know what you think about this one in the comments, and if you liked the video, please give it a like, and please subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great day, I'll see you in the next one. So this chapter opens up with a bunch of Neo heroes taking down like random monsters and being like real brash about it. And then we hear that they're told by Child Emperor to leave the monsters intact so that he can examine them, or as they say, uh, perform an autopsy. And then we see Child Emperor like examining the corpses and he has like his laptop out. And he says, just as I suspected, this one has the same implant. The implant he's referring to goes back to chapter 130 when he was examining that huge dragon level eel monster that Blue had defeated. While examining that, he found that there was also like a microchip in its head. And he says, a microchip, these can be implanted into wild animals to recognize individual specimens or into humans to allow for easy electronic payment along many other purposes. But after he discovered the chip in chapter 130, he was then encountered by Webby Gaza. She was like, hey, what are you doing? You know, kind of like suspiciously. And we kind of see the same thing happening here because Ryuman uh, comes up to Child Emperor in less of an aggressive way, I guess, that Webby Gaza came across, but still he's asking Child Emperor like, hey, why are you checking these corpses? And this extremely long-winded response from Child Emperor is essentially just one long, uh, I guess, poop joke. Uh, in order to just throw Ryuman off of his scent because, you know, Child Emperor was also suspicious of Webigaza. So him giving this long-winded response to Ryuman and specifically not mentioning the chip that he has is to just, you know, throw him off and be like, you know, don't worry about it. But then upon further inspection into these monsters, Child Emperor discovers even more to them. But he says, there are some artificial muscles built into its body. And on top of the naturally occurring monsters, these monsters with mysterious chips in them are appearing out of nowhere. And it's not just their brains being manipulated, a good portion of them have had enough body modifications that they may as well be called cyborg monsters. They're powered up enough to have their disaster level increased, who could possibly be controlling them? So I think this is all but confirming that the organization is, you know, definitely behind this as, you know, me and I'm sure a lot of others have, you know, already come to that conclusion at this point, but it's nice for at least Child Emperor to just straight up say it. Now the whole cyborg stuff, this is new. We didn't know that they were doing that. We knew that they were kind of experimenting on the monsters to make them more powerful, but now we know that they're doing the cyborg stuff because they're doing it to members of the Neo heroes as well, because, you know, a couple chapters back when Metal Knight encountered Ehrman and Destro, they straight up, you know, 
put their cards on the table and were like, hey, you know, we're making cyborgs here because they did it with Infelsen Avon Zaditz and they were gonna try to do it with Metal Bat as well. So yeah, put two and two together here. Just This is the organization doing all of this stuff. But we'll come back to that stuff later because now we have the Hero Names Victims Association uh, encountering the Neo Heroes. And it turns out that they're like defeating the monsters before they can even show up or just the Hero Association in general because they reveal that like they, they dispatch vehicles and helicopters that get moving almost right as the evacuation announcement starts. But then we hear an emergency announcement for City H, and this prompts like the Neo Heroes to go run after it, and even Saitama starts sprinting to go to City H to get to the disaster before the Neo Heroes can. But then we come back to Child Emperor, and he's like trying to talk to Metal Knight through his computer. And then he asks Metal Knight, if a person was modifying monsters and attacking people, what purpose do you think that person would have? But then also right after this sequence, we see that when Saitama shows up, up to the disaster in City H, the Neo Heroes have already defeated the monsters there. And what we can kind of gather here is that maybe it's not that the Neo Heroes are so fast to the disasters, but it's that the disasters are put there purposely for the Neo Heroes to react to them. And this also goes back to what Child Emperor just said. You know, if a person was modifying monsters and attacking people, what purpose do you think that person would have? Now, before I go any further, let me try to explain what this means. And what he's talking about here is the ultimate goal of the organization. And let me also put it out there that this is just my take on things because clearly we don't have the truth yet. But as I see it, uh, based off of information from the webcomic and the manga, two different continuities, but still ultimately trying to tell the same story, uh, at least in my opinion. So long story short, the organization has supplied these suits to the Neo heroes so that they can fight against their augmented monsters to collect the data for them. And this data accrual will ultimately make the organization more powerful. But anyway, continuing this sequence, we're getting a name reveal from Child Emperor here. I'm pretty sure this is the first time we're ever hearing this, and apparently his name is Isamu. And if anybody would know this, it's clearly Metal Knight, because Child Emperor, aka Isamu, was his former assistant. But not only that, Metal Knight is like completely dismissive of Child Emperor here because he has gone to the Neo Hero. Going as far as saying that like, they're not even allies anymore and that he's not allowed to come to his lab. Child Emperor's like, by taking such attitudes towards me, you're only making me grow more suspicious of you. And Metal Knight's like, do as you wish. I have told you not to trust anyone at all from the beginning. And this is true because he does say this to Child Emperor. But also another little interesting thing is that Metal Knight kind of knew that the organization was like the big thing to worry about this whole time because he says that, I suspect there's something behind the shadows that's even bigger of a threat than the Monster Association. And at that time, he was referring to the organization. And him, you know, telling him not to trust anyone means that he's already suspected that someone has infiltrated the Hero Association from the organization, also the Neo Heroes, and he is right, because Drive Knight has infiltrated the Hero Association, and Eremin and Redestro are essentially pulling the strings of the Neo Heroes. And then after a little more back and forth between them, Metal Knight then says, are you going to do anything with that big doll you're secretly building? So this is pretty cool because he's obviously referring to Brave Giant. We haven't seen this in the webcomic yet, only in the manga. But I like that this is teasing that we're probably eventually going to see uh, Child Emperor reveal Brave Giant at some point. But also this confirms Child Emperor's suspicion here when he says, did you install a hidden camera in my laboratory? <laughs> And I guess he clearly did because coming to the end of the chapter, we see that he is essentially spying on everyone. And then he says something pretty ominous when he's like, he can do what he wants. I won't be stopped by anyone. Now I know that sounds bad and it might be, but he's also kind of said this before because when Saitama defeated his defense robots, he looked into Saitama's history and his track record and everything. And he's like, I'll keep my eye on him on the off chance that he can challenge me. So that's two instances of him kind of saying the same thing here. Now, another thing that we could point to to try to figure out the ultimate motive of Metal Knight here is going back to volume 11's bonus chapter with the Rangers and the escaped scale monster and all that stuff. After Metal Knight discovers what had essentially 
essentially been going on with like the corruption of the Hero Association and like the black market monster trade and them profiting off of the monster and experimenting and all that stuff. He says, the Hero Association's big shots disgust me. They are exceedingly easy to manipulate, but I'll let them run free for a little longer. So this kind of seems like Metal Knight probably uh, his ultimate goal is not world domination, but to become the ultimate authority in justice, possibly. Something like that. I don't think his goals and motives are evil. It's just that he's extremely pragmatic, almost to a degree that could be considered evil. He's kind of like a politician, almost. Like, go back to the beginning of the Monster Association arc. Metal Knight just wanted to carpet bomb the Monster Association. Yes, that was going to kill Waganma in the process, but he thought, you know, hey, it's just one kid in exchange for defeating this massive threat without having to lose all of our heroes in the process. And when the Hero Association didn't want to go along with that, he was like, well, I'm not even going to participate then. So I've always gotten the feeling that he was just extremely pragmatic and seemed evil. But anyway, at the very end of the chapter, we see him like looking at multiple people he's surveilling and he says, now which one of these people will be the most troublesome? And we see like Saitama, uh, I think Blue, who's fighting a monster. But then the very last one is Drive Knight. So, hmm, things are getting really interesting now. But that's pretty much it for the video today, guys. Let me know what you think about all this stuff in the comments. If you liked the video, please give it a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great day, I'll see you in the next one. So we're seeing what happened between Puri Puri Prisoner and Raiden. This was talked about in the previous chapter, but it was kind of made out to have like an ambiguous outcome, I suppose. So we see like these Neo Hero worker guys and they're like hearing like this crazy rampaging. And this is because Raiden is training up there and he's like putting craters in the wall, but he's also wearing like the Neo Hero battle suit. I'm pretty sure this is the first time we saw him in this thing. And he says, so this is what a battle suit can do to think that I would need something like this. And then he starts to remember his encounter with Perry. So let me catch you up to speed on why they're fighting in the first place. This will make more sense for why the outcome is the way that it is. So a couple chapters back, Perry and his group of prisoners who includes Hammerhead from season one, they had just taken out like a wolf level monster and then suddenly Raiden and his gang of Neo heroes shows up. And Raiden says, Perry, Perry prisoner, I demand that you turn over all of the prisoners. For safety, I want to put them into the custody of the Neo Heroes rather than the Hero Association. If we cyborgify them with Neo's technology, they will turn into completely controllable workforce. And of course, Perry is like, nah, they're my boys. You can't take them. So then Raiden's like, well, then I guess I'll be taking them by force. And that brings us to them just straight up fighting right now. And we see Raiden like sumo tossing Perry. Then Perry like tells the prisoners to throw like these bottles of oil on him and it just like covers his body and this is like a new form uh, exclusive to the web comic called oily angel advent so this is like i don't know his off panel uh development i suppose because he also says this is my transformation based on my reflection from when the hero hunter broke my arm with martial arts he's referring back to his fight with awaken garo because like after awaken garo initially took out like the first group of s-class heroes purry dark shine and flashy flash show up and they all try to take them on together and purry comes after awaken garo with like an angel rush but then awaken garo does something and like breaks his arm you don't really see what happens Happen, it just says crack and then you see Purry's arm is like broken. But considering that Purry says by being covered in oil, throws, grapples, and other extreme techniques are nullified, I guess Awaken Garo did some kind of like Aikido arm breaking move or something like that. So then Raiden starts doing like the E Honda palm strikes to him. And then Purry says, if I just accept the pain, I would eventually reach my pain threshold. But how about if I convert that pain into pleasure? And then I guess this is like also a new technique because he says the receptacle of love is infinite. So I guess this is like some kind of ability he's developed and he's successfully able to withstand Raiden's strikes here. and. He even like counterattacks with an angel rush of his own. But Raiden like defends against it and it surprises him. And he's like, the raw material is super first class, but his senses are mediocre. His movements lack aggression. So what we can take away from this is that Raiden realizes that Puri is like superhuman in strength for sure 
but like he's giving like a lackluster effort in his strikes. And later on, it's gonna be explained why this is. So then Raiden hits Purry with a named attack called the Giant Heavy Cannon. And surprisingly, Purry is even able to take this as well. And then Raiden starts to make sense of everything that's going on here. And he says, there's no mistake. He's fighting while protecting the prisoners. He let me get caught up in the flow of our heavy blows and deliberately held his ground to meet me head on. So yeah, this whole time Purry was kind of just defending his boys because like I said in the beginning, the whole motive for Raiden being here was taking his prisoners. So then Raiden stops fighting and he's like, it seems you aren't a regular bad guy. I'll put a little faith into your approach to justice. So first of all, Purry has come a long way, at least in the webcomic. Like I said, he hasn't had a lot of development. So it's nice to see him not completely get left behind on the power scale, I suppose. But Raiden here uh, maybe came across a little underwhelming. I personally put a lot of hype on him, and I expected him to be so strong that he could maybe like one or two shot Purry. But it appears that either he's not quite on that level, or Purry has just seriously become way stronger than what I thought he was. Either way, I still don't think we've seen the peak of either of these characters' power yet, so I'm still not too clear where they both are exactly, you know, you know, full power wise, but uh, we'll be coming back to Raiden later. So as Raiden's about to leave, one of the Neo heroes is like, but we have the order from the leader to take him in. And then Raiden's like, making the execution of orders your top priority is the beginning of dependence on others. What is our main duty? It's to be heroes, isn't it? And then he's like, there's no better decision than from on-site judgment. I'll tell the leader myself. So the leader they're referring to here is, I'm pretty sure Blue because when Blue was introduced into the story, he was referred to as the leader. Now we didn't see Blue give this direct order to like, hey, get the prisoners that was with Purry or whatever. So maybe it was him that said this, or it might've been possibly McCoy like acting as Blue or Ehrman and Destro possibly, because the main goal here was to get the prisoners for cyborgification. And we haven't really seen Blue talk about that stuff. That was mainly like Ehrman and Destro's deal. So I wouldn't be surprised if these orders were coming from them, but they were acting like it was Blue that wanted it. Not really clear at this point, but it's also possible this did come from Blue and maybe there's more to Blue than what we, you know, know at this point, like I was talking about in my previous reviews. But as Raiden is leaving, we see that the prisoners are going willingly with him because they've already expressed that like, they don't wanna be with Puri Puri prisoner and they know that they can't become pro heroes because they are prisoners. And also remember, I talked about this when we first saw Hammerhead you know, reintroduced into the webcomic. He was the character that introduced us to the organization pretty much. He like took those battle suits from the organization as they later say that they allowed him to take them. And then we see the brain robot and the gray fox robot attempt to kill him. So Hammerhead going back to the Neo Heroes base, I'm sure is eventually going to have that stuff come full circle. And then Hammerhead might be like, oh, hey, Arab and Destro, they're the brain robot and the gray fox robot guy. Or he'll just be able to put it together that like the Neo heroes are being run by the organization or something like that. So then it cuts back to the Neo heroes base and we see Darkshine like training the recruits with potential. And the recruits are like, you know, you keep pouring cold water on my fighting instincts, then why don't you be my sparring partner, coach? Aren't you supposed to be strong? And then Darkshine's like, that is, uh, I, I can't give you direct guidance, I'm sorry. So this is an interesting development because a couple of chapters back when we saw Darkshine training these guys initially, he was like, next up we'll be sparring the whole group of you against me. Feel free to treat me like an enemy and use weapons even. So I was expecting to see them spar, but I guess he changed his mind. He just couldn't bring himself to do it. Also, another thing that's revealed in that previous sequence is we see the Neo Hero recruits like drinking these special drinks. And Darkshine says that these drinks allow them to build muscle at amazing speed and that they're growing so fast it feels dangerous. And these drinks supplied by the Neo Heroes are probably coming from Ehrman and Destro, AKA the organization. So these drinks are probably aiding in this like aggression that we're seeing from them in this chapter. While all of this was happening, Raiden was observing Darkshine and he says, I wonder if his spirit has been worn out from fighting evil. So this is Raiden like starting to understand why Darkshine is the way that he is because we saw that these two had an encounter you know, earlier on. And he was confused as to why Darkshine was being like submissive against him. And then Raiden says to himself, I won't become like that. When competing in super sumo, it is the spirit that determines whether you win or lose. And I have never experienced defeat. I'm ready for anything. So I'm pretty sure this is setting up Raiden for a similar comeuppance to what Darkshine possibly had. Like 
he's going to fight someone or something that he's not able to defeat and then he's going to lose himself and then possibly mentally break. Anyway, we're coming to the end of this chapter and we're getting this massive reveal because Aramon and Destro are talking and they're like, it seems that preparations for surgery are complete. Let's go fetch Metal Bat. He's been drugged for over 48 hours. I'm sure there won't be any more rampaging like the other day. So I guess this confirms that Metal Bat was defeated by Aramon and Destro because last time we saw Metal Bat, he had discovered, you know, the whole big cyborgification scam thing that's going on with Aramon and Destro and everything. And then they were like, hey, we're just going to turn you into a cyborg, Metal Bat. And of course, he wasn't on board with that. But then Mars, Leo, and Solitude show up. And it turns out they've been cyborgified as well. And they like attack Metal Bat. But then he gets up and he's like, you know, getting ready to fight against them. And that whole sequence ended there. And now it turns out that he was defeated. And like I was talking about before, I'm pretty sure that he could have easily defeated Mars, Leo, and Solitude, but it was just Araman and Destro that were the problems there because we saw that their cyborg percentages was like 94 and 95%, the highest revealed so far. And I was unsure if Metal Bat was going to be able to defeat them because of their perceived power. And it turns out that this might be the case. They might be like extremely powerful. I mean, if they are the brain robot and the gray fox robot, they're seemingly the leaders of the organization or just at the very top of it. So they've got to be extremely powerful. Now, what is going to happen with Metal Bat? Is he going to become a cyborg? I doubt it. I mean, especially because it hasn't happened yet and they're saying that it is going to happen. So I assume that maybe Child Emperor is going to figure out what's going on here and then he's going to save Metal Bat or something like that. Or just somebody is going to save Metal Bat or he just straight up frees himself or something like that. Really looking forward to seeing where this goes. Let me know what you think about this chapter in the comments, guys. If you liked the video, please give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next one. So this chapter starts off with the confirmation that Metal Bat is in fact being held captive. And that's because at the end of the previous chapter, we saw Araman and Destro talking about how they were going to turn Metal Bat into a cyborg. And I assumed that that meant that they somehow defeated slash captured Metal Bat. And it turns out that that was the case. But Araman and Destro show up and it seems like they're about to begin the cyborgification to Metal Bat. And he starts getting rowdy. And then Araman says, you don't think you can win a rematch, do you? And then we get a flashback to what actually happened between them. So Metal Bat charges past Mars Leo and Solitude and goes straight for Araman and Destro. And then Destro steps up to fight Metal Bat and we're seeing for the first time what these two are capable of. And as I expected, they're pretty powerful. Like Destro is defending against Metal Bat's strikes with like his kicks and stuff. And as Metal Bat's connecting with him, he hears a metal sound and realizes that like, oh, hey, you're a cyborg too. And this was revealed a couple chapters back when we saw Solitude like analyzing them and saw that they were 94 and 95%, the highest that we've seen revealed so far. Metal Bat even does one of his name moves, the whack-a-mole thrashing. And Destro is able to defend against this by like blocking with his forearms. And this is pretty impressive because like not even Garo and Bang were like defending in this manner against Metal Bat strikes. They more so like defended it and used his momentum against him. Both Garo and Bang concluded that Metal Bat strikes are extremely powerful and that like if they were to make contact with them, it would be bad. And shortly after this is confirmed because Araman says, Destro, check your damage ratio. If you keep taking hits like that, it'll be worse than it looks. Then we get to see one of Destro's special attacks because he like charges up his right hand and does a sparking tornado. So this is pretty cool. We're finally getting to see like what these two really powerful supposed members of the organization are capable of. But he thinks that he's taken out Metal Bat with this and then he's caught off guard and Metal Bat comes back immediately and smacks him in the head. This is kind of similar to like the Garo and Metal Bat sequence, right? Because like Garo thought that he put down Metal Bat for good with like his palm strike but then like instantly Metal Bat came up and was about to do the same thing, but you know, Zenko came and stopped it. And he hits Destro so hard that like the bat bends. And this goes back to what Metal Bat said before we go into the flashback, when he says, I just didn't think the bat you guys issued me be so flimsy, making it super easy to break. You guys did that on purpose. But after the fact, Araman says, flimsy you say, I'm certain it was quite strong. So I guess you can interpret this how you want. I personally don't think they gave Metal Bat a defective bat. I just think that 
It's a combination of Metal Bat being so strong and Destro being so durable. I mean, I don't think it's uncommon for Cyborg's heads to be like super durable because this is even pointed out by Genos when like he was going against Face Ripper. But at the same time, I really wouldn't be surprised if it's an inferior product to the original bat that he got that was given to him by the Hero Association, which he still might possibly have because when he showed up to the Neo Heroes initially, he had a bat with him, so Maybe that will come back into play later. But Destro was able to get up after getting smacked by Metal Bat, which is pretty impressive. But by this point, Erman has already shot Metal Bat with like dozens of like tranquilizer darts and this puts him down. But we cut back to real time and they're pulling Metal Bat down the hallway with the chains. But then Blue randomly shows up and he says to Erman and Destro, while fighting with a level dragon, the battle was so fast, there were some bugs with enemy signal acquisition. So I came here for some maintenance on my lenses. So first, of all the dragon that he's talking about this could be referring to the eel monster that he fought a couple chapters back or this refers to that monster that we saw him fighting at the end of chapter 135 when metal bat was like surveilling him i think it's probably the latter here but also we're finding out that blue has like these robotic contact lenses but then of course blue realizes that like they have metal bat chained up and he's like what are you guys doing and metal bat's like hey blue these guys are bad and, and then blue starts analyzing them with his contacts so out of nowhere this person person shows up who is revealed to be the true leader of the Neo Heroes, and his name is Fuzzy. But not only that, this guy is also the grandson of Shibawa and has inherited her precognition powers along with her estate. And his henchman also claims that he's going to become the leader of the new world. Okay, so... <laughs> What is this all about? I honestly don't know. This is like crazy. But inheriting her precognition powers likely means that this guy is an esper to some degree. Because her precognition powers is referred to as the third eye ability, which is like an ability that espers can learn, I suppose. At least as it's indicated by Psychos in her high school flashback. And of course, this raises so many questions. So can this guy use the third eye ability as well as Shibawa, meaning that like are all of his predictions 100% the way that hers were? And of course, has he also seen what Shibawa saw before she died? Or the thing that Psycho saw that made her go insane? Unclear at this point, but I guarantee that this guy will be connected to that stuff for sure. But anyway, this guy lets Metal Bat off the hook and he says that Aramin and Destro were kind of jumping the gun on the whole cyborgification thing and that it's not meant for literally everyone or anyone they deem worthy to be a cyborg. There's like special parameters set in place for this to happen. And Metal Bat didn't meet any of them. And it's further reinforced that Aramin and Destro are in fact third party acquisitions by Fuzzy here. So it's not like they were always under him or that Fuzzy is even a part of the organization, which I don't think he is given what we're learning here. So I think that kind of dispels that. Fuzzy is definitely just his own thing here. He's the true leader of the Neo Heroes and that Araman and Destro are, you know, in the organization and it still stands that they infiltrated the Neo Heroes. I mean, even Fuzzy kind of lays it out himself when he says that they have experience with things like guarding dignitaries, counterterrorism, and infiltrating underworld organizations. But then Fuzzy says that he suspects Metal Bat is like a double agent when he says, you see, we receive information that there are efforts inside the Hero Association to try and crush our Neo organization. So that's pretty interesting. Like who told Fuzzy this? It's unclear at this point. Maybe it was Metal Knight possibly because we saw that he was arguing with Child Emperor a couple chapters back. So maybe he fed them some information anonymously just to try to shake up things because he also has beef with the Hero Association as well. But I ultimately think that this will probably tie back to Child Emperor regardless because you know he's been you know pulling out the chips of these monsters and stuff and investigating things. But Fuzzy says that they're going to keep Metal Bat like contained for now until they figure out things and then Metal Bat is is like compliant with it and he busts out of the chains kind of like in a flex that like hey i'm still ultra powerful and that i could take you guys down if i really want to but you know i'm just gonna play along for now but then we cut to blue like sitting on top of a building and he's talking to himself and he's trying to figure out ways to have like cooperation between the neo heroes and the hero association and he thinks that maybe talking to one of the top heroes will help. And at first he says, maybe he'll talk to Tatsumaki. And I was really hoping that this would happen because we know that Tatsumaki is heavily tied to Blast. So I would like to see her reaction to the son of him and what they would actually talk about. But 
No, that's not gonna happen. Then he teases talking to King. That would be interesting, but that's not gonna happen. And he ultimately decides on talking to Saitama about this because he thinks that he has influence because of the protests and stuff. And that's where the chapter ends. So I guess this leads into the second encounter that Blue and Saitama are going to have. And it seems like it's probably not going to be like aggressive the way that we initially thought it was going to be. It seems like he's legitimately going to try to discuss things with Saitama. And this way he'll feed information to Saitama that he normally wouldn't have had. But that's pretty much it for the video today, guys. Let me know what you think about this chapter. Where do you think things are headed? Man, it's really heating up right now. Uh, but if you liked it, please give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next one. So it's starting off with us seeing Blue on like a televised interview. And I guess this is just to further promote like the Neo Heroes and whatnot. But the interviewer guy is constantly asking questions about Blast, you know, naturally because Blue is the son of Blast. And I guess in this sequence, we're getting more insight into Blast, at least from the continuity of the webcomic. Blast has had way more of an expansion in the manga than the webcomic, which is a kind of funny because you'd kind of think it would be the other way around, but now it's like the webcomic that needs to catch up to Blast. But Blue says that my father may as well be retired already after all. And then the civilians hearing this, like watching the TV, like outside on the street. They're like, what, did Blast retire? And then somebody else says, the Hero Association announced he was taking some sort of hiatus from activities. And then Blue says, I'm not sure how much I should say about my father. I don't think he has any intention of coming to the forefront anymore. He never really seemed like that type to begin with either. So like I said, this is the webcomics continuity catching up to the already established lore of Blast from the manga. Like a lot of the stuff that's being discussed in this sequence is more or less what Sitch was saying in chapter 85 of the manga. And then Blue says, the only ones who had recognized my father's face are the small group of people who have met him in person in the past, right? And maybe the top brass of the Hero Association? At any rate, he's always made sure to secure an escape route like that. Well, I'm the one who was yelling at him the most about that anyway. Right now, for me, he's the perfect example of what not to do. I'm not gonna run away. Giving us more insight into Blue's mentality going into becoming like the Neo leader that he is now and just his overall motivation and trying to become the true leader of all heroes, essentially. But then the interviewer says, uh, about Blast's hiatus, does that mean that it's not because of a top secret mission or that he's sick or has some kind of ailment? And then Blue's like, you should direct any further questions to the Hero Association, though I doubt they'd give you a straight answer. So that's pretty interesting when he says the top secret mission thing, because at this point, at least in the manga's continuity, it seems like that's why Blast is on hiatus because of the whole cube god stuff, right? I mean, that certainly could be considered a top secret mission. Now, I'm sure that this whole cube god storyline will be reintroduced into the manga. And the fact that Blast is being talked about here, and not to mention how he's been talked about for essentially the last 30 chapters or so, I guess Blast is going to show up eventually. And then the whole cube storyline is going to be reintroduced into the webcomics continuity. And then at the end of the interview, Blue says, take a look at this battle suit before long we plan on having a licensing system set up for public distribution soon we'll be in an age where anybody can become a hero so that's also pretty interesting i think this is giving us more insight into the overall goal of the organization they don't only just want the heroes who have already been established to have these battle suits they just want to give these battle suits to as much of like the general population as they can so that you know they can have more puppets to control for I guess ultimate global domination. That's just me speculating. It's not confirmed that this is their ultimate plan yet. But then we cut away from the interview and we see in the streets, there's like a couple B-class heroes fighting these random monsters. And they're not doing too well against them until suddenly the Neo heroes show up and then save them by defeating the monsters. This has kind of been like a recurring thing in this arc so far. But then it's revealed that these monsters had like a leader monster with them, I guess. And he's standing on top of this building and he's a straight up dragon and he's called the Master King. But then out of nowhere, Blue comes in on his jetpack that we saw a couple chapters back and he straight up one shots this dragon, just flies straight through him. This is such an exciting sequence and really shows how strong Blue is. I did not expect him to be able to do this because while he had defeated a dragon in the past, it was like super high difficulty, right? And like the entirety of that battle happened off panel, but considering the implied effort that it took for him to take that down, you wouldn't think that he'd be able to just 
easily take out a dragon like this. So either that eel monster was like a high dragon or something and much stronger than this dragon, or Blue has progressed in power since then. So then Blue comes out of the building like a Chad and then greets the B-class heroes who are having a hard time. And he looks at the B-class hero Heat Edge and he's like, oh, your sword broke. Here, take this lightsaber. We've got plenty at the Neo heroes. And this is just further influencing more hero association heroes to go to the Neo heroes. And then Blue's like, your side also has a few crazy ones mixed in even outside the S-Class, right? Like Saitama. And then out of nowhere, Forte shows up and he's like, yeah, you know Saitama? He's a close pal of mine. And then Blue's like, oh, that's perfect. I have something I want to talk to him about. Can you get me in contact? And it's essentially because he wants to exchange opinions on how to consolidate on-scene command under one entity. This goes back to what I was saying about how Blue essentially wants to become the one above all heroes, kind of like what Blast was supposed to be. But then Forte basically lays out the blueprint of Saitama to Blue. He's like, look, he's super strong, but he just sees being a hero as pretty much a hobby and he's really no leader. So maybe he's not the best person to be talking about stuff with this. And then Forte goes on to like kind of pick apart Blue and the Neo heroes as a whole. And basically what he's saying here in a very roundabout way is like, hey, I get that you have good intentions, but you're going about things the wrong way. And he's like, if you really wanna do what you're trying to accomplish here, then you need to have some kind of attractive quality that would make them think I can trust this guy with my life. Being like a great friend or someone they can look up to because he says that the Neo heroes are only kind of seen as like human cogs at this point. Yeah, they're very effective at doing their jobs, but the public doesn't really see anything else other than a replaceable task force, even Blue himself. And then Forte eventually says it's like, you're Blast's son, right? Why don't you just ask him for some advice? And then this angers Blue and he's like, this has nothing to do with him. And then Forte says, fine, I'll let Saitama know that there's a young man who wants some counseling from him. So then it cuts to Ryumon having this interview. And I guess he's just also spreading more seeds of doubt to like the regular heroes and just the public in general saying that like, just give in to the battle suits, give in to becoming a Neo hero because that way you won't really be risking your lives anymore. And then he says, I wonder what anyone is thinking not moving over to the Neo heroes yet. You should probably come over while you're still alive, right? Or maybe we won't know till someone influential dies. And then it cuts over to this new demon monster that we haven't seen before. He's like the lightning equivalent of like Deep Sea King almost. And he's already defeated a couple A-class heroes. And wouldn't you know it, Moomin Rider shows up defending like this class of kids. And going back to what I was saying about Deep Sea King, this to me feels like the sequel to Deep Sea King. King, or at least that one iconic sequence that he had with Moomin Rider. So Moomin Rider, you know, foolishly and psychotically goes after this demon level monster and of course gets crushed as expected. But while this is happening, there's like this monologue playing over the sequence and it says, Moomin Rider, we have great respect for you. Watching your activities inspired us, your courage. You taught us that you don't need to be some amazing Superman to save lives. What we have now is all because of you. Thank you. And then it goes on a little more and basically saying that like, hey, monster are getting strong all of the time. The weak heroes are going to be called by them. You're one of the weak heroes, so you're eventually going to die sooner or later. And you should probably retire, but if you insist on fighting, and then it cuts to the person who has been saying all of this, and it turns out that it's Excel, one of the Neo leaders. And then we see him handing Moomin Rider like this suitcase thing, and he says, this is a specially built battle suit. We had it customized just for you, please use it. So I love this here. This is showing that like Excel and the Hunters came to be because of Moomin Rider. I just think that's so fascinating. And then it cuts back to the real time and Moomin Rider gets up from under the fist of the lightning demon. And it turns out that he did put the suit on that they gave him. And it is in fact some kind of special suit because this doesn't look like the typical power suit that the Neo heroes have. This looks more reminiscent to what the Paradisers had, which are both still coming from the organization, allegedly. And then Moomin Rider does the justice uppercut and then just one punch is this lightning demon. And this is amazing. It, it, this sequence is just so satisfying. Finally, Moomin Rider gets his come up. And so then afterwards, we find out what's going on in the news about this event. And it says Moomin Rider uses a battle suit and defeats a disaster level demon. This news had a huge impact on the other heroes. And then we see a bunch of other ancillary like Hero Association heroes. And they're like, follow his lead. We're transferring to the Neo heroes too. So I don't know if this necessarily means that Moomin Rider went to the Neo heroes because he's using the battle suit. I don't think 
he did, but I just think that the heroes leaving are because they know they can get battle suits if they go to the Neo heroes. But one thing I want to touch on before we move on, this is straight up an S-class level feat, easily. So if Moomin Rider continues to wear this suit, he might straight up become one of the new S-class heroes, and I think... That would be amazing and certainly surprising. So then it cuts back to the Saitama's neighbors gang, Forte, Rodent Toten, and Butterfly DX. And they're basically saying that like, hey, you know, Neo heroes are pretty impressive. They have great suits. And Forte's like, hey, I even talked to Blue. And he's like, you know, I'd be perfectly fine with going to the Neo heroes and getting a power suit, but we know Saitama now. We know what true strength is. And we don't want to go after this fake power anymore. We just want to become real heroes, you know, with genuine strength the way that Saitama has. And they basically all agree to like, hey, let's just do things our way and aim to be heroes that shine bright. So then after this, it cuts to McCoy and he like randomly runs into like one of his old colleagues from the Hero Association. And that guy's like, hey, let's catch up, have some drinks, talk about some stuff. And McCoy's like, sorry, too busy. Uh, I'll have to be another time. And he's like running away. And he says like, I absolutely can't get involved with anyone from the Hero Association. One accidental slip of the tongue and I'd be finished, Mr. Fuzz. I have no idea what kind of punishment he'd deal out if I betrayed the Neil heroes. So I think this sequence here might be setting up that Fuzzy, aka the grandson of Shibawa, might not be a good guy. Maybe he is like a big kind of villain being set up. So then it cuts over to the Hero Association executives and they're like, our last hope of making a comeback hinges on the S class. Have you still been unable to contact Zombie Man? I sure hope he didn't get taken out by some unseen monster. And they're like, uh, I doubt that. Well, no, hmm. And then in the last sequence of the chapter, it cuts over to what's going on with Zombie Man and Dr. Genus. We've seen previously to this that Dr. Genus is doing some kind of like training with Zombie Man in his basement. It's still unclear exactly what they're doing, but we just assume that this is some way making Zombie Man more powerful. And Dr. Genus is like number 66. No, Zombie Man, your symptoms have seemed to calm down. I think it's finally time to test your performance in an actual battle. And he's like, here's your opponent don't get killed too easily and then carnage kabuto steps in this is amazing and i guess this is what dr genus had in his basement this whole time but also some of you ogs are probably spotting here that this is possibly setting up you know the real time version of the classic sequence for the virtual genocide simulation you know from the audiobook story where zombie man fights carnage kabuto in the simulation and you know basically defeats him so we might actually see something like that happen happened within the actual story. So much to talk about, but let me know what you think about everything in the comments. If you liked the video, guys, please give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next one. So this chapter starts off with heavy tank loincloth running into a demon level monster fight zebra. Apparently a bunch of herbivores at the zoo in East City like monster fight. So now he's dealing with it. But obviously since he's an A-class hero, he's not going to be able to compete against a demon by himself and then randomly drive Drive Knight shows up here. And before we go any further, let me just say that Drive Knight hardly has ever shown up in the webcomic before this point. So this chapter is mainly just a device to bring Drive Knight up to speed in the webcomics continuity. So Drive Knight starts hacking up the zebra monster, but he doesn't take it out immediately. Then Geno shows up behind Drive Knight and then takes out the zebra with a blast. Drive Knight then starts to reveal like his transformation abilities along with like his black box. And Genos is like interested in this. Then Drive Knight begins begins to explain how it works and like the various transformation he's capable of with it. So a lot of the stuff he shows here, we've already been accustomed to within the manga since all of this stuff was originally revealed there, but we're seeing like his silver form, which is like the one where he has the sword. Then he shows his knight form where he becomes like a centaur. And he says silver is for cutting down, knight for omnidirectional movement. But then he also says that his base form is called pawn. I don't think this was revealed in the manga and that's pretty cool. And also if you're not aware, drive knight's form are like based on shogi pieces, which I guess is like the Japanese equivalent of chess. But while he's showing these forms, a whole bunch of other like monster fight animals start popping out. And he's basically just going to use them to job to his various forms and show how effective they are in various situations, I guess. So then he transforms into his lance form, which he says is for speed. This is interesting because in the manga, the lance form is like a, a motorcycle type thing. But in this, he kind of just has like uh, skates on. So 
another thing that I've talked about with Drive Night along with like the Shogi piece is that there's the promoted versions of each piece. So maybe in the webcomic, his promoted Lance is going to be the motorcycle possibly. Then he goes into his Bishop form, which he says is for power. Then he shows his gold form, which he says is for heat. This isn't really made out to be the huge deal that it is in the manga, but I mean, I guess it still is a big deal. It just doesn't have like the grand like entrance and performance that it did when he was going against Neon. Then he also shows his Rook form, which he says is for sky attacks. So then the boss of the monster fight animal shows up and it's the apex rabbit and he's straight dragon level. And then Drive Knight's like, shall we team up on this one? I'll distract him head on, you look for its vital. So this fight just happens in the span of two panels. We see that there was like a bunch of explosions and then at the end they defeat him and Drive Knight used his gold form to take him down. So before we go any further, I just wanna give a shout out to my boy VibHaveM. If you've been a part of the One Punch Man community for the last couple years to any extent, casual, hardcore, or whatever, through some way, and maybe even unexpectedly, your enjoyment of this series has been possible because of this individual. For many years, this guy has uh, been the backbone of the One Punch Man community, and he's been doing all of this work uh, basically for free all this time. Time. And honestly, he deserves our support. So recently he's made a Patreon and I would like to put that on spotlight here. I'll have a link for it in the description. This has nothing to do with any illegal activities or anything. We're just simply supporting an individual who has helped this community selflessly for many years now, even before I came around. So I just want to say thanks to VibHabM and uh, the links will be in the description. But now that they've defeated this dragon level rabbit monster, the rest of this chapter is just exposition and dialogue dialogue, but it's exciting and important because we're finally getting back to the big core dynamic between Drive Knight and Genos because Genos asks Drive Knight, it's like, hey, remember when you said Metal Knight's your enemy? What was that all about? And then Drive Knight says, I don't think you should take my word for it, but it was all a decoy, a plan to keep you safe from Metal Knight. That man robs others of military tech. And then Genos is like, just who is he? And then Drive Knight says, in a nutshell, he's evil. He masked himself as a hero with a sense of justice and join the Hero Association, but at that moment, most of the military defense systems have been hijacked by his own. You could say they were virtually taken over. Both as a scientist and a mechanic, he is uniquely talented. What he lacks is a sense of ethics. He can only judge things numerically. His heart is basically the same as a machine. Okay, so from this point on, I'm going to say something that's, I guess, kind of controversial. And if you're familiar with my chapter 119 review, that's when Drive Knight originally gave his big rhetoric about Drive Knight in the manga, but he was talking to Sitch in that situation. But like I said in the beginning, this is the webcomics continuity bringing Drive Knight up to speed with everything. So now he's talking to Genos about all of this stuff. And what I'll say here is that in my opinion, Drive Knight is not telling the truth here. What he's basically doing here is projecting himself on to Metal Knight. Like everything that he says and that I'm going to be discussing from this point on is not actually what Metal Knight is or what he wants, but it's actually what Drive Knight is and what he wants. But also that means this is an extension of what the organization ultimately wants because I believe that Drive Knight is linked to them in some way and they ultimately want the same goal. Now let me also say that this is not the first time that one has used characters to project onto others other characters. He's done this before with a My Mask and Zombie Man. If you go back to like around, I think like chapter 93 or something, when the S class is having like their meeting before the strike team, a My Mask straight up projects himself onto Zombie Man in front of everybody else. Although of course it's not known at that time because it wasn't revealed that a My Mask was truly a monster yet. So I full heartedly believe that he's doing the same thing here with Drive Knight and Metal Knight. But aside from all of that, there's also one huge element to Drive Knight, which is going to be subtly revealed in this chapter. And when we get to it, I'll start going into that as well. But anyway, Drive Knight continues saying, did you also know that the Hero Association has a monster facility? Officially, it's a personality correction facility where they research ways to suppress and rehabilitate the monster's cruelty and violence. But in reality, those monsters are brainwashed. The facility's purpose is to remodel them, clone them, and turn them into soldiers. They are bioweapons that only obey the instructions before he gives them. And then Geno says, monsters do show up a lot lately. Do you think Metal Knight is involved in that? And then Drive Knight says, I can't exclude the possibility that there were some monsters controlled by him in the bunch. So that right there is pretty interesting.
interesting, right? We've seen this happen throughout this arc. Those monsters randomly showing up, like those five dragons a couple chapters back, and then Child Emperor pulled out those chips inside of them. So at this point, maybe you'd think that like, oh, I guess that means that Metal Knight was doing it. But no, this is actually what the organization is doing. The organization is the one who has the battle suits in the first place, and they're releasing those monsters just as a way of having more foot soldiers, and as he says, bioweapons, but also so that the Neo heroes wearing the suits can fight the monsters and therefore gain more data and make them more powerful as a result. And this goes back to Drive Knight saying that Bafoy steals technologies from others, it's actually the organization that stole the technology from Bafoy. Remember going back to when Child Emperor said that, hey, I saw the designs for the type of Neo Hero power suit that they're wearing in Bafoy's laboratory. The organization essentially got that information from Bafoy by like scavenging the broken robots destroyed by Saitama when he went to the Hero Association back like after the Monster Association arc was over. We see the brain robot in one of the surveillance cameras that Bafoy is observing. That's at least how it happens in the web comics continuity. In the manga's continuity, G5 goes into the Monster Association and recovers the broken Metal Knight drone and then gets the information that way. But going further, Drive Knight says, and that's not the only game he plays, he contacts people with dangerous ideas. He grants them the power to realize those ideas by lending them his scientific power. Then he lets them go on a rampage, turning them into useful pawns. So this is another interesting thing. What he's talking about here is what I think how the organization got too fuzzy the grandson of Shibawa because he's the true leader of the Neo heroes, but also his technological support is coming from the organization, you know, AKA Araman and Redestro. And he's also the people with dangerous ideas, which I think is going back to the previous chapter about why McCoy is so scared of him. And then he says he wants to destroy everything at once, just like playing in a sandbox and rebuilding the world he has full control over. I guess this is the ultimate goal of the organization. And then Drive Knight says some stuff and it basically boils down to him saying, that like he can't trust anybody in the Hero Association anymore because some of them might be in cahoots with Metal Knight. And then Genos is like, if that's so, then why are you telling me this? And Drive Knight says, because I believe we are under the same circumstances. Someone with mutual enemies, with mutual goals of extermination, I believe it's worthy placing my trust in you, and so I have. And this goes into why I think Drive Knight is trying to gaslight Genos because he sees him as a powerful ally. He wants to bring him over to the organization because he's basically, you know, just one foot in the door already being like a cyborg and a pretty powerful one at that. But then Drive Knight just drops the hammer here and he says, my village was also destroyed by a rampaging machine, one that he created, Metal Knight. It was the same individual that destroyed your town and family, the mad cyborg. So this is massive. But going further, he says, the elusive rampaging cyborg that indiscriminately delivered complete destruction countless times. It is one of the many autonomous weapons of destructions brought form into the world from before his countless weapon experiments. Whether it be cyborgs or AI controlled robots, he has spawned countless murderous machines into the world. By exterminating these machines and collecting samples, I have continuously modified and strengthened my body. Genos, the one you call the mad cyborg. There has yet to be evidence that it was taken out by another hero, and yet for some reason it ceased showing up these past few years. Most likely, Bafoy is preserving it as a trump card, as it's too valuable to deploy needlessly and risk damage. It's probably being kept idle within Bafoy's weapon storage. So if you've been following my channel for a while now, you know that I fully believe that Drive Knight is the mad cyborg. And I think that this is all but confirming it right now. But also he says that like Bafoy is making like cyborgs and stuff like that. That's obviously not Bafoy's game. We've never seen him dabble in stuff like that. But who have we seen use stuff like that? Araman and Destro, who are probably the Gray Fox and Brain Robot, who are seemingly the main components of the organization at this point. But a very interesting thing here is that when we see the mad cyborg here from the back, it pretty much just looks like a stripped down Drive Knight. I mean, honestly, just look at it for yourself. And also Drive Knight being the mad cyborg just makes so much sense. And just for the narrative that's being built up here. He's getting very close to Genos. He's gaslighting him, making him think that they're working together towards this mutual enemy in Metal Knight. But it actually turns out the whole time that he's been manipulating Genos and that he is the mad cyborg. But I think the real nail in the coffin here is when he says, and yet for some reason it ceased showing up these past few years. Hmm, I wonder why. Oh, it's because you're the mad cyborg and you decided to come out as Drive Knight. 
therefore the mad cyborg is not gonna show up anymore. But then finishing off the chapter, Drive Knight says, the time is now, Metal Knight has already made his move. Using strengthened monsters causing chaos and distress, he'll use his full arsenal to deal a final blow to an already shattered world. His army of robots will attack, the cyborg will undoubtedly also appear. So before that happens, I want to spearhead an attack from this end, will you join me, Genos? So things are getting so interesting right now and I cannot wait to see where this goes but that's pretty much it for this one i've already rambled enough let me know what you think about all of this in the comments i know that a lot of you are not going to agree with me and that's fine that's why we have this open discussion about everything but if you like the video please give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't already have a great day and i'll see you guys in the next one so we're picking up from the end of the previous chapter with drive knight still talking to genos about the whole metal knight allegedly creating the mad cyborg stuff and he says i've narrowed down the list of before strongholds to three possible locations before knows i am investigating him it will be easier for you to carry out the investigation as he doesn't suspect you yet we didn't know that drive knight was uh, aware of the potential location of dr Dr. Buffoy's laboratories. And second of all, we didn't know that Metal Knight was aware of Drive Knight investigating him. So as I talked about in my previous webcomic video, I think that the organization who Drive Knight may or may not be affiliated with ascertained information from Metal Knight by scavenging like the broken drones that Saitama destroyed or just through some other means. But this is how they were able to get the information on the battle suits that the Neo heroes currently have. And I guess this also led to Drive Knight or just the organization potentially figuring out where Buffoy Buffoy is located. Just a theory, of course, it's not confirmed. But as for Drive Knight saying that Buffoy knows he's investigating him, I want to go over to the manga's continuity right now. Again, two different continuities at this point. They're both ultimately arriving to the same destination, just in two different ways. But in chapter 85 of the manga, when Metal Knight is talking to Child Emperor, he says, I'm not afraid of the Monster Association. Right now, other evils want to harm the world. They will strike when humanity's defenders are weak so be careful don't trust anyone around you so that is extremely important dialogue in my opinion and i'm going to keep coming back to it because it's all kind of making sense now. In my opinion, this is Metal Knight subtly telling Child Emperor that like, he's already figured out that the organization is like the real threat here and that they're lurking in the shadows. And when he says, don't trust anyone around you, I think because he realized or figured out that Drive Knight was investigating him. But going further, Drive Knight says, going near the stronghold is a very dangerous task. I want to entrust it to you, kind of passing on his dirty work to Genos here. But then he says like, if you do go there, you know, Metal Knight's going to defend himself with some pretty powerful stuff, so you're probably going to have to fight him to the finish. It's essentially going to be really dangerous. And, but then he also says that I've heard that Tornado and Flash have been assigned separate missions. I think it's safe to assume that this is another one of Bafoy's tricks. So what he's referring to here is what happened in Chapter 130 when the Hero Association told Tatsumaki that it's come to our attention from a certain source that some powerful espers are plotting something sinister and this eventually leads to Tatsumaki going after like an Esper group called the Eleven, led by this guy named Otento, who Tatsumaki is aware of. And as for Flashy Flash, they tell him about the abandoned masses who await at the remains of the Ninja Village, so he goes to investigate that. So that all kind of checks out, but the really interesting thing is that it's come to our attention from a certain source. So either it is Metal Knight that relayed this information to them, as Drive Knight is saying here, or this was the origin organizations doing or just straight up drive nights doing but you know covertly and i thought originally that when tatsumaki and flashy flash were kind of exiting this arc it was because one maybe didn't want them included in the inevitable civil war between the new heroes and the s-class heroes because they were just too powerful but now it seems like it's not just because of what one wanted to make the story more balanced but it's what the organization wanted removing two of the strongest s-class heroes from the battle here obviously tips the balance in their favor and it ultimately goes back to what metal knight was saying to child emperor is that they will strike when humanity's defenders are weak now going further into all of this drive knight says just one thing the appearance of the neo heroes is something even he before did not expect if it wasn't for their efforts the public order of all the cities would have descended into chaos by now we'll let neo 
take care of the monsters while we use our strength to dot dot dot. So that's another sus thing from Drive Knight here. He's totally on board with the Neo heroes, who at this point, I believe, are having their strings pulled by the organization. And also Fuzzy, but by proxy, the organization. Fuzzy's motives are unclear at this point, but I'm more so focusing on the organization. But before giving Drive Knight a definitive answer, Geno says that he's gonna have to think about it and discuss it with the people that he trusts, Saitama and Dr. Kuseno. And then Drive Knight says, of course, I'm relieved that you're calm. My real name is Zero. See you again soon. So now it's time for some wild speculation. So I can't take all the credit for this uh, because somebody in my Twitch chat brought this up to me, but Drive Knight's name being Zero here could be a clue as to him being the leader of the organization. Now in the web comic, we haven't really seen like the G robots yet. They've been referred to as like machine gods, but in the manga's continuity, they have been shown to be G. And the first one that we saw was G4. So his name being Zero here could mean that he is G0, implying that, you know, he's like the first G or even beyond the first since, you know, he's not G1. And that's actually what I talked about in my Mad Cyborg video last year. I originally thought that Drive Knight was probably gonna be revealed to be G1, but now it seems like he's gonna be G0. Just taking a guess, of course, but I think that would be pretty interesting if that turns out to be the case here. So then we cut over to Saitama and Genos meeting up with Dr. Kuseno, and this is the first time they're all meeting in the webcomics continuity. And we see that Saitama brings like his Game Boy with him as a way of him like deciding if Kuseno is truly trusted worthy or not and he hands it to him and he's like you know can you fix this and then dr guzetto just is like i've replaced this screw on the loose button and then that instantly wins over saitama i love this it's just you know classic one humor so then genos relays all of the information about metal knight and the mad cyborg that drive knight told him to dr guzetto and he says if he's colluding with members inside the hero association we can't carelessly ask for backup and then saitama says if you're suspicious of metal knight you know why don't you just ask him directly in person and Dr. Kuseno says, I disagree. We'll be throwing away the advantage of him not being on guard against Genos yet that Drive Knight told us about. And then Genos says, you know, if he finds out, then he'll go into hiding and that'll be a problem. It's best to assume that the next time we meet, it'll be to fight. And then Saitama straight up suggests that he just does it for Genos, like takes out Metal Knight or whatever. And then, you know, rightfully so, Genos is like, no, I'll be the one to take care of him because this is like Genos' main point to the series here. It's like, he, he has to do it. But then I guess they come to an ultimatum and he's like, well, I'll just accompany you when you go and take your revenge. And if you're about to lose, then I'll destroy it for you. Is that okay? And Genesis is like, yes, thank you. Then Dr. Guseno says, even if the information is real, you probably will not be able to invade it with ordinary methods. I'm sure there are powerful guard robots deployed and unknown traps laid about. And then Geno straight up confirms that he himself is now disaster level dragon. And he says, as long as they're not at a similar level, I should be able to break through it head on. And if that's the case, I'd like to head over there right now. And then Saitama's like, no, you know, he has stuff to do with the hero victim name association. Then after some more dialogue, Genos eventually asks Dr. Guseno to measure Saitama's physical data. This has been brought up so many times for like the past year or so in the webcomic. And now it's finally happening. And I was always wondering about that. And I'll get into what I think the ultimate importance of this is. But anyway, Kuseno says it will take some time, but can you sleep in a machine for a while? And then Saitama's a little hesitant about it, but then he wins him over with some free barbecue, which, you know, Saitama's a sucker for. So then they eat and Saitama falls asleep inside of like this hyperbaric chamber looking thing. And this is denoting obviously that time is passing. And then I guess in the middle of the night at some point, three robots show up and it's implied that they're shooting or something. So who are these robots? Not really sure right now, but the first thing that came to my mind was they look like organization robots. I mean, at this point on the surface, I suppose it's being implied that these could be Metal Knight robots because obviously they were talking about Metal Knight and going after him, but I don't think that's necessarily the case here. These more match up with the aesthetics of the organization robots in my opinion. But going back to what I was talking about, G0, 1, 2, and 3, if you'll look at the eyes of these robots, you'll see that the one has one eye, the one in the middle has two, and then the one has three eyes. Does that mean that this is G1? two and three and drive night is in fact g0 i don't know maybe i'm looking too much into it but it is there so then i guess saitama is hearing them attacking 
and he wakes up and breaks out of the chamber and then it cuts to the end of the chapter with Dr. Guseno like bleeding out with Genos holding him. And he says, Doctor, if Dr. Guseno is in fact dead here, this might be the most significant character death that we've had in the series so far, possibly. Or at least one of them for sure. Now, why are these robots coming after Dr. Guseno? Well, I'm assuming that since Dragonite has come into contact with Genos, maybe he was able to track his location and then figured out where Dr. Guseno was or he just knew already. And he sent his organization robots there to kill Dr. Kuseno so he can further put the blame on Metal Knight. He could be like, hey, Genos, Metal Knight sent those robots to go kill Dr. Kuseno. Now you have more motivation to go after Metal Knight, right? You're going to help me out now. I'm assuming that's what's ultimately going to play out here. This is just an attempt to make Genos, you know, fully come over to Drive Knight's side. But if Kuseno isn't dead yet, I think he'll have one last speech that he gives before he dies, which will be like pretty substantial exposition, I hope. But going back to the whole Saitama data stuff being collected. We're obviously seeing this for a reason and it certainly happened. Don't know if it was fully completed. It doesn't seem like it was, but some data was certainly collected and it's possible that the organization might straight up steal this data. I mean, it is something that they do. And now that they could potentially have this data on Saitama, either Drive Knight will power himself up with this or they'll make a new robot that is like minimum above Dragon in strength or something. I don't know if it'll necessarily have anything to do with the limiter. I don't know how that stuff works in relation with cyborgs or just robotics. I would just be rambling if I went on about it, but that's pretty much it for the video today, guys. Let me know what you thought about this. Very exciting. Can't wait to see where this goes. Let me know what you think about all of this in the comments. And if you liked the video, guys, please give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great day. I'll see you in the next one. So at the end of the previous chapter, these three robots shown up who are allegedly from the organization. And it appears as though they straight up killed Dr. Kuseno. So this chapter is picking up with us seeing Genos reacting to that. That. And as you expected, he's not too happy. And he immediately starts fighting the big guy, but then it's revealed that all three of these robots are disaster level dragons. This is something that I speculated about in the previous review because, uh, you know, they, I guess, look like dragons. And I'm assuming that the organization would only send like super powerful guys at this point because they know how strong Genos is. And another thing is that their names are all machine god. You know, like what we've seen with most of the organization robots at this point, or at least the ones who randomly show up places. And I thought maybe these guys were like G1, G2, and G3 because of like the eyes that they have. And that still might be the case because the webcomic doesn't call these organization robots like G. It's always been like Machine God and then some random name. The G stuff is for the manga's continuity. So maybe once we see these guys then, maybe they'll be referred to that possibly. So then Genos activates Scorching Core. I'm pretty sure this is like his most up-to-date form that we were aware of. And he starts going after them again using that but it has like no effect on the machine gods. Then Geno starts showing us other cores that he has, such as like floating core, which is self-explanatory, and then super magnetic core, which is also self-explanatory, but more so this one, uh, just straight up giving him like metal manipulation to a certain degree. And he creates like this huge metal spear thing. I'm sure this reminded a lot of you of Kid from One Piece, but this too really has no effect on the machine god either. But machine god tech says that's quite a luxurious ability he has. If he could have been able to master it to perfection, he could aim for the top of the hero world. So is he talking about the super magnet core? Because like, I don't see why Genos is overtaking Tatsumaki and Blast if he mastered that. Unless he's just talking about the ability to use like multiple cores, because that's also something I wasn't aware about coming into this chapter. Like before this, I thought that Genos was only using like one core per form. Like that core was like the makeup of what he was using at that point. Point. because I think we originally saw a lightning core. That was like the reveal of the new core stuff that Genos was doing. And then we saw scorching core, but I don't think it was ever revealed that he can just go through them like he is in this chapter with like the floating core and the magnetism core. And actually he has more than that because all three of them start attacking him at this point. And they're overcoming him because, you know, we got three dragons here. Then Genos uses freezing core on Machine God body and actually freezes him with it. But then he goes back to the lightning core like I was talking about the first one I think was revealed and he hits Machine God Tech with a high voltage tackle. Then he does the craziest thing I think Genos has ever done in the webcomic at this point. He activates Roaring Dragon Core and this makes him unhinged. He looks like mob question mark percentage here. And Machine God Ray says a torrent of super high energy, long-term continuation possible, sustainment limit estimated 
lasted 30 seconds. So does that mean that this is like Genos's webcomic version of his full power 10 seconds from the manga's continuity? Because that was, I think, first introduced in chapter 94 of the manga. Like after receiving his new upgrade from Dr. Cruceno, he was told that if he were to use the full power of it, he'd only be able to do it for 10 seconds because any more than that, he would just explode. And it lived up to the hype because when he actually did use the full power for 10 seconds, he was able to deflect attacks from like an above dragon, Sairochi. So does that mean that he's that strong in this continuity? Well, there's no way to say for sure yet, but man, it seems pretty comparable. Because after activating this, he defeats all of the machine gods with like one or two moves. It is absolutely insane how far in power he jumps after just activating the Roaring Dragon Core. And like I said, these are dragons. He just defeated three dragons with you know, relative ease. And this is one of the very few times we've ever seen something like this happen. But the fact that this is like Genos or just a standard hero doing this is ultra impressive. And this is making him easily one of the strongest characters in the series right now. But Machine God Body is still not completely down yet. And he says an next human cyborg is better than us top class AI. So confirming that these guys are AI, we knew that the organization sometimes does send out these AI guys like G4, AKA Machine God Zimzimov, he was like an AI, but we also know that they have like cyborgs too. Then Machine God Body reveals that his true ability is incorporating components from other units to instantly extend and remodel himself. And he says, now that I've pulled in parts from two Machine God series units, I'm insanely strong. And then he starts attacking Genos, which reminds me of like Carnage Mode, Carnage Kabuto. And he says, I'll pull you in too, turning me, Machine God Body, into the strongest pillar in the plan. So I'm assuming the plan is the organization like ultimate goal. But it's also showing you that there's some serious levels to organization too, because if this guy who was already a dragon at base fused with two other dragons, so he's even stronger now. I don't know how strong exactly, but stronger than a low dragon probably. And in this new form, he's implying that he's still not even the strongest in the plan. Obviously there's organization powerhouses that we haven't seen yet. But anyway, Genos just one shots this guy with a final smash. Yeah, like I said, Genos is just completely insane in this chapter. But it's not over yet because there's seven more robots that show up afterwards, but thankfully Saitama is back now and he just one shots all of them in a pretty cool sequence. Then they try to take Dr. Crescendo to the hospital, but he's still able to talk and he reveals the location for the final armor that he made Genos. And it comes with the latest system upgrade too. So is that gonna make him stronger than the Roaring Dragon Core? Uh, not really sure. Maybe it'll make him as strong as the 30 seconds full power, but all the time maybe? That would be a little too outrageous. But it has to be somewhat of an improvement over the current one that he has. But then Dr. Crescendo says, for ages I wanted to apologize to you for giving you the power to fight and roping you into my quest for revenge. So like that's understandable but what exactly is your quest for revenge? I mean, obviously you're going after the mad cyborg, but like, why? Who is the mad cyborg? How do you know him? Why are you going after him? There's so much that Dr. Cusano hasn't said. Now that he's dead, it's like, what's going on? Is this just gonna be real posthumously, like through Drive Knight or Metal Knight or something? But then Geno says, hashtag Cusano did nothing wrong and thank you for everything. Then we cut to Geno's getting the new upgrade and it looks pretty cool. And he says to himself, somehow the enemy caught wind of the information we had obtained. Um, probably because you were talking to Drive Knight a couple chapters back. So then him and Saitama start to head out and Geno says, I'm heading to destroy Metal Knight's research facility immediately. And Saitama says, right, I'll go too. They're still under the assumption that Metal Knight is the big bad here. Then they notice that a city is being attacked and there's like planes and buildings going down. We see Child Emperor, Excel, and Blue reacted to this too. And it appears that there's all of these robots in the city like lighting it up. Another interesting thing about this is that they all look like the Metal Knight robots. So in my opinion, this is because the organization has purposely done this to make them look that way so they can further put the heat onto Metal Knight. And this is pretty much what Drive Knight has been doing this whole time, like trying to make everyone think that Metal Knight is the true big bad here, projecting all of his machinations onto him so that he can continue to hide in plain sight, but also take out his biggest competitor at the same time. But yeah, that's pretty much it for the video today, guys. Let me know what you think about this in the comments. Do you think Metal Knight is the true big bad? Do you think Saitama is just gonna one-shot everyone? Let me know. And if you like the video, please give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next one.